Um, uh, I guess good afternoon for most. Good afternoon for most of you. I see that there's also some people from the US. Uh, so good morning as well. And um, I, the, the stuff I will present is this basically the content is based on work from uh, mostly one PhD students um, who already finished uh, one or two years ago. Uh, actually, I guess it's about one year ago. Uh, and, and some of you may already have seen that. And I will try to, to bring some conclusions uh, related to that work and, and also some, some uh, ideas about what, what the future may bring. So uh, I will talk about alias based optimal control of wind farms. And um, many of you, or some of you may know that, that we have been pretty active in this field. We have been looking at optimal control of wind farms based on LES. And the idea was to, um, to basically optimize wind farm controls in space and time in an LES environment to see what is what is the maximum that, that we could do in terms of energy extraction. We used we, we, we looked exclusively at energy extraction and not so much at uh, load reduction, although that's obviously also very relevant. Here is some references that you could have a look uh, into if you're interested in this work. Um, I'm not going to discuss these things in full detail uh, at, in this presentation. Uh, so, so one of the things that came out of that uh, and that, that has received a lot of interest uh, recently is is this uh, a notion of dynamic uh, induction control, control where you sinusoidally uh, change a truss setting uh, of a turbine in the front row and then basically uh, because of the development of some strong vortex structures you manage to increase the weight mixing and uh, overall increase energy extraction. And this is um, a video from a, uh, a simulation by Andrew uh, Yilmaz uh, also some years ago and actually this was also been taken up by um, uh, by a team from Delft and uh, Munich and Milan in, a, in the wind tunnel uh, to also show that it really works in real life. So what we actually did in, in this, this uh, earlier studies is we, we used uh, large study simulations and we basically optimized the controls in large study simulations. But we, we essentially just simply presumed or we had our system which was a large study simulation itself and then the model was an exact duplicate of, 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 of our large scale simulation model. So we could just simply optimize in that model and in control terms, use a feed forward control because you have an exact model and an exact knowledge of the state. So you don't need feedback at all, just to do a speed forward, forward at that point, which is obviously quite, a, which is obviously quite artificial. Uh, what you really should do if you think about, about optimal control is you have a real wind farm. You should obviously estimate the state in some kind of way um, starting from that state, you have a state a, a state model basically that allows you to optimize the control control for the current time or for the foreseeable future, and that is what you feed into the wind farm, right? So you basically get a feedback system. And the question then is, the, obviously, can LES as a model be fast enough uh, to uh, implement this in, in real time? And uh, I, I should say that the work we did before, like this, this, this top graph. That was definitely not real time. It was pretty slow. Um, so, we, uh, you know, uh, supercomputing and basically uh, order of a month of uh, computing time to, be, to basically maybe represent, uh, you know, half an hour to an hour of control time. So basically pretty, pretty slow. Um, so can LES be fast enough to use uh, this as a state model in real time? And then just to, you know, to give some order of magnitudes what we are thinking about and what you should be thinking about. So if you have an optimal control time horizon of say 600 seconds, that's obviously just a number that I pick here, it could be different. And that you and you would use a control update frequency of 30 seconds, which, which is also just a number that I picked here that could be reasonable, then the LES should be at least 20 times the number of optimization steps you need in this optimizer and also possibly in the state estimator. So 20 times the number of optimization steps faster than real time. So just to, to give a somewhat, you know, maybe realistic value of the number of optimization steps you may need, that could well be about 200. So you may need to, to run 200 LES. Uh, so times 20, so you have four times, and you need to be four times, thousand times faster in real time, at least, right? And could be that's, that's what we would be talking about. And obviously, I guess up to now, people did, do not consider LES to be a model that you could really run so fast. Usually it's supercomputing 
it's uh, you know waiting for results forever and and hope they work uh, not something that that we, we would consider in this type of context so that's basically the question that we're asking is this is it, would it be possible so let me uh let me briefly show you the outline so the first uh, part of the talk, uh, well, I just gave an introduction. So this, the, the second part of the talk, say, is is a, is a question: Is LES fast enough for real-time use? I will not fully answer this. I will just give some outlook and some idea there uh, based on some study we did. And then uh, the third part of the talk is about state estimation. That would be the first. I mean, if you then really want to to use it as a real-time control, you would need to do state estimation, and you obviously you also would need to do optimization. So actually. We look at the first step. Can we actually reconstruct a an LES flow field given some measurements in the atmosphere? And then some conclusions. So is LES fast enough? So to study this, what we did is a bit of an you know um, you know a theoretical study. Say, if you look at the, the top graph, what we looked at is a piece of the atmospheric uh, boundary layer that we that we possibly would simulate in LES. So here you have a domain of forty kilometers long. Uh, five kilometers wide, um, and this domain is represented of a grid of 128 million grid cells. Okay, so this is a really a, a typical LES uh, high resolution. Takes you a lot of time to, to simulate that. The fact that you you are able to, to represent 40 kilometers of, uh, of of domain somehow, if you know this initial condition, then obviously you can afterwards predict the future by by basically convecting this in in an LES forward in time. And given a, uh, a distance of 40 kilometers at, say, a wind speed of 10, 10 meters per second, that would uh, give you a, uh, a prediction horizon, say, of 4,000 seconds that you could maximally predict the future, right? Uh, probably somewhat less depending on, on conditions, etc. I will possibly come back to that. So, this is, say, a fine scale LES that you could consider. The question is now. Uh, the question is, I mean, the point is that obviously this is way too expensive to, to use in real-time control. But obviously you can make LES much cheaper by coarsening up the map. So we have here a second grid level where we just simply coarsen the mesh by a factor of two in each direction. Uh, and then we have a, a second level where we coarsen again by a factor of two in each direction. And a, and a last level where we again coarsen by a factor of two in each direction. So essentially, grid level three is uh, 500 times coarser than grid level zero. So you only have 250,000 cells in grid level three. And you should know that if you portion up in each direction by a factor of two, that the, the, the computational power that you need uh, is reduced by a factor of 16. So grid level two is 16 by 16, and grid level three is 16 by 16 by 16 times cheaper in principle. Okay, so obviously you can just do that, coarsening up the solution. And, and as you can see, starting from this initial condition here that I have on the top view, the coarsen solution looks pretty the same. Um, so that is nice. The question is then, if you now start up the simulation and you, you try to predict the future, something that you would need to do in an optimal control setting, would you still be able to somehow accurately predict the regions where you have a high velocity and the regions where you have a low velocity and somehow um, potentially use that in control setting. We are not going to do, use it in a control setting. We are just going to look how accurate do our predictions remain uh, if we do simulations in the future. Okay. So first question you could ask is what about speed? So what is the speed of the top simulation and what is the speed of the you know, level one to a three? And so that's what we measured here. So this is actually the, the speed measurement. And so grid level zero, that's what you find uh, over here, the bottom row, say, of the figure. And you see here that depending on the number of nodes you do, so one node here has 20 uh, cores, so two, one node gives a sort of two, 10 core, I could reach the uh, uh, APUs, so essentially 20 cores. Uh, and then you can go up to 60 nodes, so that means that you have to get 320 cores that you would use, right? But in, in all these cases, our code is parallelized, in all these cases, we are slower than real time. So what is here actually in the, in the x-axis is the, uh, the wall time divided by the simulation time. So if this is a number that is bigger than one, we are slower uh, than real time, okay? You need to wait longer than actually you are, the time that you are simulating your simulation. If you go now to grid level three, what you see is that you are much faster than real time, obviously, um, because the simulations get a lot cheaper. And you see that you are up to a factor of 100 faster than real time. So 
This does not, that's still not 4,000 times faster in real time, but you, you see that we are getting somewhere in the neighborhood of something that may be possible. Um, what I should also mention here is that here in the, in the grid, grid zero uh, simulations, you see that these uh, symbols are nicely spread out. So actually the 16 nodes is considerably faster than the eight nodes. If you go to the grid level three, the 16 nodes is actually not faster than the eight nodes. And this is just related to the fact that if you only have 250,000 cells and you, you distribute them over 16 nodes, you are just more communicating than doing calculations. So essentially, the, the, the point I was making earlier that um, uh, you know, forcing by a factor of two gives you a speed of a factor of 16, that's not entirely true. You get the computational power theoretically goes down by a factor of 16. But in a parallel framework, uh, you cannot keep distributing necessarily the, the cells over the same number of processes because you have some parallel efficiency issues. But nevertheless, also here you see that, uh, you know, even for instance on uh, four nodes, you get speed up that is maybe a factor of, you know, 200 or uh, also faster than, uh, than your cell. Okay, we did a detailed error analysis that I'm not going to discuss this. Uh, I'm just going to refer you to this paper. But it's in, you, you can identify different components or contributions to the error. You have the model error, which is in our case, uh, you know, the mismatch between the fine and the port grid. But in reality, it could also be some more as, as effects that, that could enter there. And then there's a restriction error, the fact that you will present reality on a port match instead of a fine. And then you can, you have two additional contributions in, in this uh, model error. Uh, one is what, what you could call the stubborn scale error, which is still related somehow to what you would typically call a model error. And the other, which is pretty interesting, is the chaotic divergence of trajectories, because we don't have a, like, a, we term as a chaotic system, it's not uh, a, a classical stable system. So if you give a small perturbation, trajectories will also diverge. And that also, even if you are perfect, so to speak, in, in terms of your state estimation, you will not um, uh, be able to predict the future forever. Okay, but let's just look at some results, some things that we found here. And let's first look at the blue curves. So the blue curves that you see here, there's actually different blue curves. Uh, there's labels within the blue curves. So label one means this is actually the line for grid level one. So this is the, the finest, grid, grid level zero is a reference, right? Grid level one is the course name with the factor of two is reference. So I can see that the blue curve is actually the, a prediction of the instantaneous wind turbine velocity. So actually it's a disk velocity, say, um, at the level of a wind turbine. So this is the instantaneous prediction of a wind turbine velocity uh, in the future. And so you start obviously at time zero, that, that prediction would be perfect because we have actually a perfect porcelain of our mesh. Uh, and then uh, if you look into the future, you see that the prediction gets worse and worse. And around, in this case, 2000 to 2500 seconds, uh, your prediction passes above this, this uh, level one, and we actually have normalized this error in such a way that the level one actually means that you just, instead of considering that there was turbulence fluctuations in the flow, you just assume that there, there was only a mean flow, and you just simply use the mean as a predictor. Um, and so that is something that you would always do if you don't have any detailed turbulence information. Uh, you, you will just simply do the, take the mean and, and Essentially, if you go beyond 2,500 seconds, taking the mean is actually better than taking the, the prediction of the LES. So at some point, the LES is so much decorrelated from, um, from, the, from the reference that its prediction gets worse than just simply using the mean. Okay, you see also for grid, grid level two and grid, grid level three that it gets a bit worse, but it still remains reasonably okay up to say a thousand seconds. We also did it with the Taylor frozen turbulence hypothesis, and you see that the LES beats the Taylor frozen turbulence hypothesis in terms of quality of the prediction. And then if you look at other, uh, uh, you could look at the same wind turbine velocity, but over a five minute average, and so five minute time average, and then you can actually predict longer in time. And also a 30 minute average, you could still even predict longer in time. So depending on what you exactly need, you may be able to predict uh, longer in time or not. Um, okay, and you could bring all this information together somehow in a accuracy versus the speed um, uh, plot. Okay, and so in the on the on the on the left axis you have the uh, the uh, the accuracy, and the, on the bottom axis you have the speed. And and here you have this solid line, so you don't 
should not go over the one here because then you get worse than just taking the mean. And you should, should not go beyond the one here because then you are slow and then we are fine. And you see there is areas actually that, uh, that you are actually fast in real time. The question is obviously if you are not fast in real time, because remember we should actually be 4,000 times or something like that fast in real time. Okay, so but nevertheless, imagine that you are sufficiently fast in real time. Would you then be able to, you know, given measurements, reconstruct something meaningful from which you can start an LS? Because an LS needs a total flow field. Just it needs much more than just the mean. So the type of question you need to ask is: say, for instance, you have an atmospheric boundary and you have a light that's sweeping around in the atmospheric boundary, you get this kind of measurements, you get all the line of side velocity along the light. Just kind of pretty sparse compared to you know the full 3D velocity, but the question is can we reconstruct that? This is something we have been studying. So essentially imagine that you have the 3D velocity field, then you can obviously have a measurement operator on that 3D velocity field, and that would give you the LiDAR measurement, right? It's something you can implement given the LiDAR properties. We use real LiDAR here, wind tracer. Uh, you see some, uh, some points uh, that you can have along the LiDAR, so you can have many points at the same time. And then what you really want to do is you want to make the difference between the LES time series and some LiDAR measurements. You want that distance to be minimal. And then there are some tricks that we can do to, to basically formulate that. So you can take uh, the LES solver, and the LES solver can you know, generate a velocity field based on its initial condition, u minus t. Right? And essentially, if you so essentially what you need to find is you need to find this initial condition u minus t that somehow minimizes the distance between the LES velocity field and the space. We need some we need some tricks, we need some projects on POD modes, not reducing the problem, but just a transformation. I refer you to the paper to really find out details. And then you essentially end up with an optimization problem where you basically optimize the initial condition of the LES so that along the time horizon that you're considering that you are matching the LES uh, prediction uh, with the LiDAR prediction, okay? And then obviously you hope that somehow you, you are able to uh, reconstruct the pre field. So this is an optimization problem. We solve it with an LDFGS uh, algorithm and we use a joint to calculate the gradients. Okay, so here's a setup. We have a reference, so we don't use real LiDAR measurement at this point, sorry uh, to disappoint you there, but uh, we have a reference domain, which is a very fine mesh. And then we have a reconstruction domain, which is a, a coarse mesh. So we measure in the reference domain and then we reconstruct it in the reconstruction domain. And then afterwards we can compare them obviously, which is pretty nice to see how good we are, okay? Reference domain about 140 million width cells, reconstruction domain about 4 million width cells. By the way, this is much finer than the 250,000 width cells of the courses setup that I was discussing earlier. Um, so we did not do it on a, on a 250,000 uh, width domain. Okay, um, and so here is the result. So on the, on the right, you see the reference domain. So this is the, that's actually our ground truth. And on the, on the left, we see the reconstruction and the reconstruction is a function of time. It's over a timer window of, of about 200 seconds that you actually reconstruct this. And you can actually see this happening. So you see here the reconstructed domain that you really get the, the structures in the reference domain pretty well, a little bit coarser. What you also see is that you only reconstruct somewhere in the region where you have somewhat measurements. You, you, you reconstruct away from the LiDAR beam, but the LiDAR beam needs to pass sometimes in that area to be able to reconstruct something. This is just a comparison along the line, so uh, just to give you a feeling. Uh, what is also interesting if you look at the streamwise vertical plane is that also in the vertical direction, you are able to reconstruct structures, even though normally uh, construct in the streamwise on, on the streamwise plane. And this is related to the fact that turbulence is co somehow correlated. So meaning that if you have a high velocity at the LiDAR, there's a relatively high chance that you also get a high velocity above that. And that is something we can use in the framework. This is just with all the scanning patterns and you also see with all the scanning patterns that, that you may be able to reconstruct the field better for instance at higher altitude. Okay, that brings me to my conclusions. Uh, so the first uh, part of the talk, I basically, uh, you know, was somewhat discussing the question whether LES is fast enough for real-time control. Probably not in the next years, I think. Um, we were probably, probably possibly still a factor of 100 too slow, um, maybe even more. Uh, if, if it would be a factor of 100, then we would just follow, so we, do, we would do nothing and just wait for more law to, you know, make computers faster than we would need to make, wait for 10 years. 
Uh, but maybe it can be faster, obviously, if we do some algorithmic uh, improvements. And obviously, maybe 100 is, uh, maybe it's a factor of 1,000 as well. I don't know if uh, it's still, still, still out. Say. And so it really will depend also on the amount of detail that is necessary for effective control. So the question is whether with, with this course mesh, you have enough information to really do something effective in terms of control. If you look at the reconstruction of 3D turbulence, it is definitely possible, but, but only in regions where, where measurements are at least sometimes available. So questions that are still open is what would still pass sparser measurements? Imagine that you don't have any LIDARs but only wind turbines. Would you also still be able to do something meaningful? And there are still a lot of challenges, obviously. So what is necessary in terms of um, uh, you know, reconstruction versus what algorithm to use is still open. We use a variational approach, but you could also use filtering approaches or combination of them. Uh, a big other question is also how to parameterize the covariance. Uh, so there's quite a number of uh, challenges out there as well. Okay, and that brings me to the end of my talk. Um,